We want to welcome you to our services this morning. It is certainly good to see uh, each one of you here this morning. It's good to see some of our uh, folks back with us and thankful that they had a uh, safe journey and are able to be back with us this morning. We appreciate the presence of, of everyone. Our services this evening will be at six o'clock and then on Wednesday evening at seven <coughs> o'clock. Our gospel meeting for 2023 is now history. I thought we had a good week and I certainly appreciate everyone who participated and who contributed to our successful uh, week that we had this past week. I thought Brother Reed did a good job in presenting the lessons. I think he had a lot of good things to say and presented some very good lessons for us. There was one word that Brother Reed used this past week, and I believe that he only used it one time. But it is a good word. It is an outstanding word. And this morning, I want us to consider this outstanding word as we continue to consider the theme of just say yes. This morning, let's just say yes to balance. Balance is so very important to our lives. However, we probably give little thought as we go about our daily lives to the importance of balance. When things get out of balance, then we have problems. Most of you arrived at the building this morning in a vehicle. What you may not realize is that you were able to do that because of, Brother Mike, balance, right? The wheels on your vehicle are balanced. There's little weights that put on the wheels to, so that they are balanced. What happens if those weights fall off? You get a lot of vibration in a hurry. Your engine has to be balanced. Recently, my son's vehicle, one of the cylinders wasn't firing. That doesn't work too well because it's now out of balance. Uh, most vehicles have a harmonic balancer. And I checked with my resident expert and friend and brother, Drew Newman, and knew, Drew made this statement concerning the harmonic balancer in an engine. He said it is very critical in an engine or it'll shake itself apart. And his uncle Mike would agree with that, I'm sure. So balance is very important to your vehicle. Without it, you may not have gotten here this morning. Balance is important in seesaws. I had to teach my brother the hard way that balance is important. Seesaws, you don't put an elephant on one end and a parakeet on the other. It just doesn't work. One day my brother thought it would be funny to sit on his end of the seesaw and hold me up in the air. That's not what a seesaw is for. So I jumped off, I ran under the board that was on the sawhorse, a two by six oak, and I picked that board up and I threw it off of the sawhorse as my brother sat on the other end. It broke his arm. He learned the hard way that balance on a seesaw <laughs> is important. We were very young, <laughs> that was years ago. And when he called yesterday for me to come help him, I went without any, any hesitation. What about an unbalanced checkbook? Greg, you ever have any, see any of that in your business? <laughs> the human body requires balance. Family and work must be balanced. How important is balance to the human body? If your blood sugar gets out of balance, you've got problems, don't you? What about dehydration when your water level is out of balance? your electrolytes, your equilibrium, your thyroid, iron, kidneys, and so forth. When these things get out of balance, we can have serious health issues. 
But what about the church, the body of Christ? Is balance important to the church? Brother Iron North wrote a book years ago, ago called Balance. It is one of the best books that I've ever read. And we'll come back to that later. I believe, if I recall correctly, I bought a copy of that and gave to you and Brother Weaver years ago, if I remember correctly. It is a great little book. It's still available. I think it would be good for every Christian to read uh, that book. The church is the body of Christ. And balance is important in the church. When things get out of balance, they tend not to. To work well and so it is with the church I would suggest to you that 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is all about balance the church at Corinth had some problems things had gotten out of balance regarding several things they had gotten out of balance concerning the one whom they were to follow some were following Christ some Cephas some Paul and so forth they had gotten out of balance concerning uh, morality a man had his father's wife and they had not dealt with that situation they had gotten out of balance concerning the Lord's Supper and Paul dealt with that in chapter 11 and they had gotten out of balance concerning spiritual gifts 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is the first of three chapters of the 1 Corinthian epistle to address this imbalance concerning spiritual gifts Paul is dealing with the miraculous spiritual gifts of the first century. In chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, Paul makes it abundantly clear that those gifts would come to an end. They would serve their purpose and would come to an end. Although today we do not have the miraculous spiritual gifts that were present in the first century, there are some principles set forth in this 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians that has application to the church today in order to maintain proper balance. And so let's look at this chapter uh, very quickly as we think about the importance of balance in the church, the body of Christ. We're not going to read the chapter for sake of time, but verse 1, we should not be ignorant concerning the gifts, the talents that we have been given. Verses 2 through 6, different talents, different gifts, different abilities are given to each, but God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit are the same regardless of the gift or talent that we might have. Verse 7, your gift, your talent, is to be used to profit others, not just yourself. Verses 8 through 11, we have been given different gifts as God has seen fit to give us. You did not get to choose your abilities, your talents, your gifts. God gave them to you as he saw fit. You're able to choose how you develop those talents and gifts and how you will use them. But God is the one who determined the talents that you would have and how many. In verses 12 through 14, there's one body but many members. In verses 15 through 16, every member is important. Verse 17 speaks specifically to the idea of balance in the body. Notice what Paul says, if the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? Every member is important. Number verse 18, God has placed us in the body according to his will, not ours. Verse 19, out of balance. Verse 20, many members which make up the one body. And then verses 21 through 24, every member is important. Every member has a place in the body. Every member has a function in the church. If a member of the body is not functioning, that member is dead. In John chapter 15, Verses 1 and 2, we read the words of Jesus when he said, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away, 
and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it that it may bring forth more fruit. What happens to the unproductive branch? It's cut off. It's dead. It's of no value. And so if we are not functioning and doing what the Lord wants us to do in the body, then we're dead and we will be cut off. The Apostle Paul talks about this idea of balance. In Ephesians chapter 4, he talks about the fact that God gave gifts unto men. And then notice what he says in verse 16. For whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies. Folks, that's balance. Compacted together in every joint supplying according to the effectual work and the measure of every part makes increase of the body under the edifying of itself in love. Every member doing their part causes the church to grow. That's what Paul says. Books have been written. Seminars have been given. Studies have been made about church growth. And Paul, in this one simple verse, tells us all we need to know about church growth. Here it is. When every member does their part, the church grows. When you think of the work of the church, think of the little honeybee. The work of the church is benevolence, evangelism, and edification. Let's look at those just a little bit closer. Benevolence is the idea of doing good. Jesus, it said, went about doing good. I believe the case could be made that the miracles of feeding the multitudes could be considered benevolence. Jesus met their physical needs on those occasions. Evangelism is reaching the lost, taking the gospel to those who are outside of Christ. Edification is basically the idea of keeping the saved saved. We can baptize people, and that's something that we desire, but we also need to recognize that we need to keep those that are baptized saved. We need to make sure that we bring them in the front door and don't let them get out the back door. We need to close the back door. And that is a very real problem that we have in the church. I know of a man who baptized hundreds and the church where he was preaching actually declined in growth because there was nothing being done to edify those who had been baptized. He moved to another place and he put on Facebook that he had baptized someone in that new place and that is great. I asked the question, what are you gonna to do to keep them saved? One of his elders sent me a private message and said, what do you mean by that? And I told him what I meant by that, that there needs to be something done to make sure that those people remain faithful because baptism is not the end. It is only a means to the end of eternal salvation. And so the church must be involved in edification. So the work of the church is benevolence, evangelism, and edification. We find all three of these in the early church. In Acts chapter two, we find all three Benevolence, evangelism, and edification present. Peter preached the first gospel sermon, and 3,000 obeyed the gospel that day. That's evangelism. In verse 42, and they continued to test fastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, that is, those who had been saved. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread and in prayers. That's edification. In verses 42 to 45, Luke records these words. And all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. That's benevolence. 
And so you have all three in the early church as recorded here in Acts chapter 2. But when it comes to the work of the church, which one of these is more important? Some would say evangelism is the most important. And certainly we would not disagree that evangelism is important. That is the reason why this congregation for years, as we note on the screen from week to week, has supported mission efforts in many different places because of the importance of evangelism. And so we do not deny that that is important. Some would say that edification is the most important. And it is important. It is very important. And the assembly of the saints becomes an important part of edification. Provoking one another, encouraging one another. The Hebrew writer says, assemble yourselves to encourage one another. Uh, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. <coughs> Some would say that benevolence is the most important. And that is the main thrust. The problem with that is that the church becomes nothing more than a salvation army. Benevolence is important. But I would submit for your consideration that they are equally important. That one cannot be elevated above another. Is the evangelist more important than the dear sister who cooks a meal and takes it to a family in need. I want us to look at benevolence a little closer because I'm afraid that sometimes we have considered benevolence sort of like a redheaded stepchild that is just a necessary evil. In Matthew chapter 25, Jesus paints the judgment scene for us. After he separates the sheep from the goats, placing the sheep on his right hand and the goats on the left, he says to those on the right hand, Come, you blessed my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Matthew 25 and verse 34. Then he gives the reason why they are to inherit the kingdom prepared for them from the foundation of the world. Notice verses 35 and 36. For I was hungry, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Folks, that is benevolence. Notice Jesus didn't say, come because you baptized all these people. Notice Jesus didn't say, you... Uh, you're invited in because you went to church all of these years. He says you're invited in because you have gone about doing good. Feeding the hungry, visiting the sick, so on and so forth. The righteous, Jesus said, will ask on that occasion when they did these things for Jesus. And Jesus will respond in as much as you did in the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. In Acts chapter 9, we have the account of Dorcas, a woman described as being full of good works and alm deeds, benevolence. This woman died. And they sent for Peter. When Peter arrived, the widows showed the coats and garments which Dorcas had made. Doesn't say anything about how many people she taught the gospel. Not saying that she didn't. It doesn't say about how many times she went to church. Not saying that she didn't. But Luke records for us that this woman was involved in good works. Benevolence. Making coats and garments for those widows. In Mark chapter 14, Mark records the event of the woman anointing Jesus with an ointment of spikenard. Some protested, but Jesus said she has done what she could. 
have we done what we could? In January of 1998, my family and I began <coughs> worshiping and working with the church in Flipping, Kentucky. There was a couple in that congregation, an older couple, brother and sister Hay. Brother Hay had not obeyed the gospel until the later years of his life. And Brother Hay and Sister Hay cleaned the building. But Brother Hay made the statement on one occasion. He said, there's not much that I can do for the Lord. He says, but there's one thing that I can do. I can be in my seat when the church comes together to assemble. You know, Jonathan told David on one occasion when David requested not to be present at the king's table, David was told by Jonathan, your seat will be empty. You will be missed. When Brother Hay had to be absent because of health, he had some problems with cancer. His seat was empty. He was missed. But he was an encouragement to those who were there. The work of the church Brother Iron North's book that we mentioned a few moments ago, in that book, Brother North makes the statement something to the effect, the work of the church is so broad that every member should be able to find their place in the body. There is a place in the kingdom. There is room in the service. There is work that we all can do. And we need to make sure that we are doing all that we can to further the cause of Christ using the gifts and talents that we've been given. You know, the one talent man wasn't condemned because he had one talent. The one talent man was just as important as the five talent man and as the two talent man. He was condemned because he didn't use what he had. And we need to use what we are given. In our songbook, there is a song and I'm not going to try to lead it, and you should be thankful for that. But the last verse of that song reads thusly, O oh Jesus, if I die upon a foreign field someday, t'would be no more than love demands, no less could I repay. No greater love hath mortal man than for a friend to die. These are the words he gently spoke to me. If just a cup of water I place within your hand, then just a cup of water is all that I demand. But if by death to living they can thy glory see, I'll take my cross and follow close to thee. We sing that. Do we believe it? If we don't believe it, we shouldn't be singing in my estimation. God wants us to use what we have. You know, some people say, I would do this and that if I had... God's not interested in what you would do if, if, if you had such and such. God's interested in what you're going to do with what you have now. As one preacher said, God's not concerned what you would do with if you had a million dollars. He's concerned about what you're going to do with the dollar and a quarter that you have in your pocket now. God wants us to use what we have, and he has given us those abilities. It was sometime in the 90s. I don't remember exactly the year. We were in Moss Bluff, Louisiana. And one Monday evening, I went to the monthly business meeting of the congregation there, the men's meeting. And when the chairman of that meeting asked for new business, there was a motion made. The motion that was made was, and I quote, I make a motion that we fire the preacher. Of course, I was the preacher. The motion was seconded. There was a rather lengthy discussion that was held. The man who had seconded the motion withdrew his motion, and so the motion died. I had not said anything during all that time. A man sitting across the table from me said, I don't know what we can agree on. And I said, Brother G, I know what we can agree on. 
And he said, what's that, Bill? I says, we can agree to get busy and do the Lord's work here in Moss Bluff. And he said, and I'm not making this up, folks. He said, that's your job. I'm serious. Don't look at me with those big white eyes, Patsy. <laughs> that's what the man said. That's your job. I said, Brother G, it's not just my job. Now, here's where things get out of balance. He said, well, 90% of it is yours. That's out of balance. This is the same man that told me one Sunday night. He said, Brother Bill, do you know why the church is not growing here? I said, no, why, Brother G? He says, because you're not wearing a tie on Sunday night. <laughs> That's out of balance. <laughs> We need to keep things in balance. We need to be busy as little bees about the work of the church. Each one doing what they can in benevolence, evangelism, and edification. There is work for all of us. There's work that we all can do. Let's just say yes to balance and get busy <coughs> doing all that we can to further the cause of Christ in our community. If it is to be done, we are the ones who are to do it. God has no other plan. The Boy Scouts can't do it. The Salvation Army can't do it. The grocery store down the road where Brother uh, PV House works can't do it. The bank where Brother Greg works can't do it. That's not their job. That's not their, it's the church that responsibility has given us. And if we do not do it, it will not be done. In closing, if you're going to work for the church, if you're going to work for the Lord, you've got to be in the church. You've got to be in the kingdom. If you're not in the kingdom, you're working for the devil. Just that simple. Because Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. Either he will love the one and hate the other. Jesus said, he that is not with me is against me. So if you're not in the kingdom, if you're not in the church, why not this morning make that decision? As together we stand and as we sing. I heard the voice of Jesus say,